I am. It's a sacred and revered phrase, a powerful phrase, a holy name of God that was shared with Moses at the burning bush. And when God shared those words with Moses, the Hebrew people were in bondage in Egypt under the rule of Pharaoh. And God came to Moses in the midst of the burning bush and he said, you will lead my people out of Egypt. Moses asked God, who shall I tell them sent me? What is your name? And the Lord told him, Tell them, I am sent you. I am, meaning the one who exists, the one who always has been, the present one, the one who causes things to be. In response to Moses' request for God's name, he simply said, I am. Now fast forward in the biblical narrative 1,500 years into the future. During the life and the ministry of Jesus, in an attempt to reveal his true identity, Jesus went to the sacred phrase, I am. The gospel writer John recorded seven instances where Jesus took that phrase, I am, and he attached it to a metaphor or an illustration or a phrase. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door or the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the vine. These were declarations. These were divine revelations. Jesus was revealing and confirming his identity. He was conveying truth about his person and his mission. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 10, or you can turn there in your guides. We're in week three of our current series focused on the seven I am statements. This is part one of our three-part series on the book of John. We'll study this New Testament gospel narrative in three sections of seven. First, the seven I am statements. Then, the seven miracles recorded in the gospel. And finally, seven life-changing encounters that people had with Jesus that the gospel writer penned in his narrative. Now, just a reminder, we do have a companion resource available to you. You can pick it up in the foyer, or this is the last time I'm going to do this live, okay? If you need one, raise your hand, and the ushers will bring you one. You can pay on your way out. It's on the honor system. On the way out, you can pick it up um, just in case you wanted to have it to take notes today. John chapter 10. Let's dive in. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he's brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is the word of the Lord. Now, when you take a passage of scripture, a unit of thought in the scriptures like John 10 verses one to 10, one of the ways you can study it is using the inductive Bible study method. In fact, in your guide, there are some prompts to do just that. 
When you study the Bible inductively, you're asking three questions. What do I see? There, you're making simple and obvious observations. Then you ask, what does it mean? There, you're making interpretations. What does Jesus mean when he said this? And then lastly, what should I do? You're making application of the passage. Now, I wish we had two and a half hours to sit down and work through all of this together, but you've got to get to lunch and we've got another service. So let's just do question one this morning together. What do I see? I'm gonna put the passage back up and I want you to, to look at it and just, what do you see? Answering questions, who, what, when, where. Maybe you see some repetition of terms or descriptions or comparisons and contrasts. Does anything jump out at you? Here's what I mean by simple and obvious. Jesus is talking to someone when he says these words. Did you pick up on that? Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And it doesn't seem to be as much of a conversation as it is a lecture. He's teaching the Pharisees. Another simple observation. What was the primary illustration? Did you pick up on it? In this passage, Jesus refers to this sheep shepherd, this shepherding terminology. In fact, there are two figures of speech, two illustrations contained in the passage, and both of them are focused on shepherding, which if you know your Bible, the Bible loves the sheep and shepherd illustration. It's used all throughout. The, the leaders, the spiritual leaders of Israel were often called shepherds. The Lord himself calls himself a shepherd in the scripture. Remember Psalm 23, verse one, the Lord is my what? But what are we called in the scripture? Nah, yeah, that's us. Isaiah 53, verse six says, we all like what? Have gone astray. So the Lord's the shepherd, the leaders are the shepherd, but we are usually called the sheep. Another simple observation in the passage is the repetition of the word gate. Or if you have the ESV or the NAS version of the Bible, the word door. It's used in the passage six times. So six times in 10 verses is an indication of what this is about. Now let's talk gate door uh, really quickly. We hold in our hands an English version of the Bible, but this passage was written in Greek or Aramaic. And as the English translators translate that Greek word, thura, some use gate, which makes sense with sheep and shepherd. Some say door, which doesn't apply to sheep and shepherd, but it's most often the way that word is used. So what are we gonna use this morning? Both, <laughs> both. You'll find it both ways this morning. Um, hey, one last observation. Um, that's not all there is, but just in our time together. There are four contrasts in this passage that, that Jesus says that there are anyone who enters by the gate, and then he also talks about those who won't enter by the gate. That's a contrast. Jesus also talk and, talks about who the sheep listen to and who they won't listen to. He talks about who the sheep follow and who they won't follow. And then three different times in the passage, the same contrast. He contrasts these thieves and robbers with the true shepherd or even himself. Let's put all of those observations we just made together and, and think real quickly. How does, what's this passage getting at? Let me make an attempt. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. He is making a contrast between himself and them using a sheep shepherding illustration to reveal that he is the gateway to eternal and abundant life. Let's walk through the passage. Look at verses one and two. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. John 10 
is a continuation of a confrontational interaction that Jesus was having with the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, about their faulty spiritual content and leadership. They claimed to be the spiritual guides of Israel, but they were actually misleading the people and Jesus was calling them out on it. And here Jesus claimed to be the true shepherd, the true guide spiritually for the people in contrast with the Pharisees, which he equated three different times in this passage today, the Pharisees to thieves and robbers. Ouch. Jesus is declaring him to be the true and authentic and genuine shepherd. Now the sheep pen was a place that the shepherd would hold his flock temporarily, sometimes even mixed in with other sheep. And there was a gatekeeper there to protect them. And the true shepherd of the sheep would enter through the gate. The legitimate shepherd would just approach the gatekeeper and the gatekeeper would let him in and he would claim his sheep and lead them out. Anyone who would climb over the wall or the fence instead of entering the gate would be up to no good. The true shepherd enters the right way. Look at verse three, the gatekeeper. He opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. The gatekeeper authenticates the shepherd and allows him in. Once inside the sheep pen, there's a second layer of validation. The sheep recognize the true shepherd. They listen to his voice because it is a familiar voice and the shepherd knows his own sheep. So... They follow him. Look at verses four and five. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. The authentic proof is revealed by action. The true shepherd of the sheep uh, calls his sheep and they follow him much like a pet running to its owner or a child Running to its parent, the sheep run to their shepherd. But they will never follow a stranger. Sheep are fearful and skittish by nature. And they run away from that which is unfamiliar. Jesus was making a claim here that he is the true and authentic and genuine shepherd. He's the legitimate Messiah and Savior. And that was true then And it's a claim that is true today. Jesus has the right to enter this world as the Messiah. The evidence of him being the legitimate and qualified Messiah is numerous. Jesus is a son of David. And the Messiah was to come through the tribe of Judah and through the line of David. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It was the prophet Micah who said that the ruler would come from Bethlehem. And Jesus was born of a virgin. It was the prophet Isaiah who said that he will be born of a virgin. And that happened just as promised. It was John the Baptist who, upon seeing Jesus, pointed to him as the Messiah and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the Messiah had to be sinless. His impeccability is the way we describe it theologically was very important. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that he who had no sin became sin for us. Jesus was validated by performing signs and miracles and wonders. He exhibited power over nature, power over demons, even power over sickness. He walked on water. He calmed the storms. He opened the eyes of the blind. And he was an anointed teacher People were amazed at the teaching of Jesus. He taught as one who had authority and the things he revealed could only be revealed to him by God. Now, he was legit. He did not slide in from the side. He did not fake it to make it. He was not making a claim that he could not back up. He proved himself the genuine Messiah time and time again. Jesus is the true shepherd. Don't believe me? I challenge you to test him. Critique him and see if he doesn't prove true in everything he says. 
Now, people will fail you. I will fail you. The church will fail you. Religion will fail you, but the true shepherd always passes the test. He has the right to enter. And the sheep know his voice. They recognize when he speaks. And true followers of Jesus recognize the powerful call of God in our lives. God's revelation is evident to his followers. His voice is unmistakable and it is unforgettable. A few years back, I took a friend of mine and his father fly fishing. My friend was 45, his father was in his 70s, and we were fishing the tailwater below the Norfolk Dam over in Baxter County. We were two miles downstream, and while we were out there fishing, the water unexpectedly started to come up. Now, it wasn't rushing downstream, don't think tidal wave, just think a leaf going by really fast, and you're like, uh-oh. And so I was with three, there was three of us, there was one more upstream, and, and we backed out of the water safely. But our friend had his head down in his box and he was tying a knot and the water was rushing just enough that he couldn't hear us. And we were yelling at him and we were all kind of dancing and doing our arms. I even threw a couple of rocks up there and he wouldn't look up. And I started to get just a little nervous because you don't like to swim and fishing waders, they fill up. And his dad went, and my friend did just like that. Above the rushing waters, 50 yards upstream, the old dad whistle. Did anybody's dad have a whistle? When my dad whistled, it meant go find a switch. <laughs> I knew what was coming. The old dad whistle, a familiar voice. He had probably heard that whistle a thousand times, and it was crystal clear that day. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. The truth of God penetrates through the noise. The conviction and leading of God's spirit is above the clamor of our world and it guides us. They know his voice and he calls them by name. The shepherd knows his sheep. He knows them by name. And I want to remind you this morning that the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, knows your name. He knows you intimately and deeply. He knows your hopes and your dreams. He knows your hurts and your struggles. He knows what you're passionate about and what you're fearful of. He knows your sins and your weaknesses. He knows you better than your spouse. He knows you better than your parents. He knows you better than your best friend or your coworkers. He knows you better than Alexa or the Facebook algorithm. He's already mapped your DNA. He knows your fingerprints. He knows your true weight and whether you color your hair. And he loves you anyway. And he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he is for you and not against you. And when you were at your worst, when you turned your back on him in sinful rebellion, he went to the cross on your behalf. We'll talk about that next week because John 10 tells us the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The true shepherd knows his sheep by name and he loves them and the sheep follow they follow the good shepherd. Psalm 23 verse one says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. The shepherd's psalm closes by saying, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for how long? Forever. He is the good shepherd and the sheep know it, so they follow him. In these first five verses of John chapter 10, Jesus is trying to make a point that he is the true and authentic shepherd. So at this point, Jesus has proved his point. He's the genuine article. He's legit. 
He should drop the mic, the music should start playing, and the Pharisees should come down the aisle and repent. But look at verse six, they don't at all. It says that Jesus used this figure of speech, his devotional number one, his sermon point number one, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So he offered a second illustration. And in this one, we find our I am statement. He continues with the sheep shepherd motif, but he becomes more direct. Look at verse seven. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full or to have it abundantly. Jesus said, let me state it for you simply and clearly. I am the gate for the sheep. If you wanna be a part of God's kingdom, then you must come through me. I am the gate. I am the door. I am the entrance. I hold the keys to eternity in heaven and abundant life on earth. You know, gates and doors by functional design limit free entry. A gate or a door is a barrier that has to be overcome to gain access. Have you ever been locked out of a gate or a door? A few years ago, I had the privilege to go watch a Kansas City Royal game with the owner of the team. Some of you may know David Glass. He passed just about a year ago. And he invited some of us to go to the Royals game with him. We got to fly on the owner's plane. We were picked up and shuttled to the stadium in Suburbans. I felt like the big deal I've always thought I was. <laughs> and when we got to the stadium, we walked up to Kaufman with the entourage and the gate was locked. And somebody goes, hey, Glass, you got a key? And he goes, I I don't have a key. <laughs> They're like, you don't have a key to your own stadium? He's like, I don't. And an employee drove by on a golf cart and, and somebody waved their hand and said, hey, can we get in? He goes, no, I'm sorry, the stadium's, well, hello, Mr. Glass. <laughs> and they let us in. As a follower of Jesus, you know the owner of the universe. You are a child, a son or a daughter of the most High God. And by your faith, by your belief in Jesus, you will enter freely through the gate. And not only will you find eternal life, but you'll find abundant life, a life overflowing with the goodness of God. Think about the power of the I am statement I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be. Saved. It's very straightforward. It's a definitive statement. Jesus is the gateway to salvation. He's the pathway to heaven. Through him, we will be saved. We'll save from what? We'll save from sin and death. Save from ourselves. Save from hell. Save from eternal separation from God. Save from guilt and shame. Save from insignificance and purposelessness. Well, what does it mean to enter through him? Well, we respond to him in repentance and belief through faith and trust, through obedience and abiding, through turning from self and turning to the Son of God, his person, his words, and his works. This passage brings us to a conclusion that impacts us all. Jesus is the gate that leads to heaven. He's the way to eternal life and he's the way to abundant life. Do you know the true and authentic shepherd? Are you at peace where you will spend all of eternity? Have you found the key to heaven? The I am statements are designed to reveal the true identity of Jesus. They are designed to draw us into a personal relationship with him. And this morning, I invite you, if you don't know him, to place your hope and your trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. 
But I want you to think with me about this statement. Jesus is the gate that leads to heaven. If this is true, if Jesus is the gate, if he is the way to eternal life and to abundant life, then this chair is really important. If we truly believe that Jesus is the way to heaven, then we need to fill our empty seats with lost souls. Amen? And what an opportunity we have before us. Because you never know how a simple invite to a friend, family member, or neighbor might change their life for all eternity. Would you pray with me? Who's on your heart for heaven? Can you think of a name that needs to be in this seat? Lift them up in prayer right now and come up with a plan of action to invite them to Fellowship Rogers. Well, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have opened the gates of heaven to us by faith, belief, through repentance of sin. We are so unworthy. We thank you that you're our shepherd who goes before us in life and leads the way, that you protect us and provide for us. Oh, we love you, Lord. We recognize there's none but you who can satisfy our souls. It's in your name we pray.